We need to end homelessness. Just having a band-aid on the problem never is going to fix it. We need to look at the reasons why young people especially are becoming homeless and then find ways to prevent what we see happening as well as safety nets and protective strategies to get them back off the streets and reassimilated into society. Aloha and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Maxim. I'm a pediatric hospitalist at Kapiolani and an assistant professor of pediatrics here at Jabsum at UH Manoa. And I'm honored and so excited to have this opportunity to talk with Dr. Cheryl Racinos today. Dr. Cheryl Racinos is an award-winning author of two wonderful books. One is called Hindsight and is about her experiences as a homeless teen in Hollywood. And the second book, is amazingly titled Beta Blockers and Coffee and is about her experiences in medical school. She is an advocate for homeless youth. She is a family physician who works as a hospitalist in LA, California, where she lives. And we are so happy to welcome her here today. Thank you for being with us, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me today. It's been an honor to come here and, and meet you and meet everyone from the campus. Um, I'm so excited to talk about you know, young people experiencing homelessness and what we can do to make real positive change. Um, as far as my background, I am now a family physician and I work as a hospitalist, but when I was younger, I was a homeless youth living in Hollywood and those experiences marked who I became. And so I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to hearing some of your story, but before we move on to that, can you tell us a little bit about your life goal to end youth homelessness, which you shared with me earlier? Um, it's an amazing goal, and I think for so many of us, it feels unattainable. And I would love to hear some of your thoughts on legislative and other ways that you could make this a reality. Absolutely. We need to end homelessness. Just having a Band-Aid on the problem never is going to fix it. We need to look at the reasons why young people especially are becoming homeless and then find ways to prevent what we see happening as well as safety nets and protective strategies to get them back off the streets and reassimilated into society. What I see is a multi-tier type of approach mm -hmm. where we could you know, first work on preventative strategies, looking at who ends up becoming homeless. Um, young people who are in foster care if they age out at 18 with nowhere to go and no family commitments, about 40 to 50% of them become homeless within a year and a half of aging out of the system. So at 19 years old, they're already homeless with nowhere to go. Um, when we look at other youth, other young people who are on the streets, we have um, young people who identify as LGBTQ and shockingly and very heartbreakingly about one in four young people when they tell their parents that they are you know, identifying as LGBTQ and come out to them, they lose their home in that very same day. They become homeless just for coming out and speaking their truth. And so we have these two great groups that we can target as our beginning of trying mm -hmm. to prevent homelessness. And somewhere along the way, some of these groups intersect. And so we can do a lot more care working with young people and having preventative strategies. What I envision is a program that has a catch system for young people where they have shelter options available for temporary, but really more looking into long-term. Um, back when I was on the streets, we didn't have long-term programs available. There were maybe six beds or 10 beds in each program. And if someone stays there for two years, that means no one else has access to that space. And so we need more. We need programs that allow for like dormitory style, style housing. We need you know houses where they can live as roommates with each other. We need low cost apartment living. We have a lot of land available and a lot of houses and apartments that are vacant and a lot of government buildings that are not being utilized. We could use that space and create homes for young people. And then once we've figured out a way to take care of the young people, we can extrapolate that to older homeless people as well. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity here. I'm really hopeful that we can make some changes. What kind of support services and 
wraparound services do you think would make these kind of programs most successful? And how do you think we could make it happen, um, presuming that a lot of it needs to happen through the legislative process? Absolutely. What we need is something with less strains attached. We need low barrier care where there aren't stringent rules. A lot of the time, the stringent rules that are meant to, you know, protect that money we're putting in through our government system um, exclude people who are surviving trauma and trying to recover in whatever means necessary. And so what we need is something that's low barrier and doesn't focus on, you know, stopping using all substances, you know, going and getting a job on day one you know, never using any kind of profanity or, or any kind of, you know, terms that are uncomfortable for adults. What we need is a place where it's safe for young people, where, you know, they're allowed to mess up and be regular kids. Because when I look at it, when I look at kids that are on the streets and they're struggling, and I go and I volunteer with them, they remind me very much of my own kids, except they don't have that safety net. You know, if my kid curses, they don't get kicked out. They don't go sleep outside as a punishment for misbehaving. If, if my child, you know, comes in late or does something else, again, they're not getting kicked out. So why do we have these stringent rules and policies that prevent care and prevent safety for young people that have already been through so much trauma? And mm -hmm. so I, I see a system where the government isn't, you know, saying we have to do these rules, but where we actually put people with lived experience on these decision making panels to make sure that we have a proper program in place to really help people recover. So in part, it's understanding that people who have lived through experiences like what you've lived through mm -hmm. and what you're about to share with us are the experts and that it shouldn't be policymakers and university professors and other sort of intellectuals who have like exclusive purview over trying to solve problems that they haven't themselves experienced and therefore cannot be really experts on. Is, is that part of what you're saying? Absolutely. I, I feel like there are a lot of programs where we are well-intentioned and we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to help people who are experiencing homelessness. But the problem is, is, you know, we're throwing a lot of money at a problem without results. And we have a lot of programs that, you mm -hmm. know, really have good intentions and, and they want to house people. But if we're only housing 100 people in a year, but 200 become homeless, then we have a problem because we're not preventing and we're never going to meet capacity. Mm -hmm. So we need strategies that work. We need people at the table who have lived those experiences, who can speak up and, and speak truth to programs that don't make sense so that we don't waste all that money and waste all that time and we can actually get to the root of the problem, which is ending homelessness. Mm -hmm. So given that you are one of these people who transitioned from being an expert through lived experience to being in the social category where you tend to get a seat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. what, what to you would characterize the perfect program? For me, the perfect program is something that provides autonomy to the young people and allows them to decide, you know, mm -hmm. what they want to see their lives look like. Do they want to live in, you know, what I was saying, like a dormitory style house with mm -hmm. other peers close by? Or has their experience been so isolating that they need the safety of their own individual apartment while they're healing? And, you know, these different types of places need to be available so that they can choose what fits them best. And we need to really focus on like a long term housing solution. What I what I really envision is when we look at, you know, young people like kids coming out of foster care um, in California, we've extended the ages from 18 to 21. Um, so that they can stay in care until they're 21 years old if they choose to. Mm -hmm. But if at any point in that three year period, they decide that they want to leave, they lose access to coming back. Wouldn't it be better if we provided them with some sort of a monthly stipend for a couple of years after they turn 18 that they can use however they see fit, give them that autonomy and help them cover the cost of rent? Rent is expensive. Right now, I can't imagine being a young person, 18 years old with no family support no you know, backup plan and suddenly you have to get an apartment for $2,000 a month. It yeah. doesn't make sense. And these are the kids that we vowed to protect. We removed them from environments that we said were unsafe and then we didn't give them what we said we would give them. Maybe we had a roof over their heads until they turned 18, but they didn't have consistency and they didn't create the kind of you know, close-knit structure that they needed to be able to get you know, through the adult life uh, after they moved on. Because a lot of people who are successful, they have, you know, family and networks that they can rely on. 
but people who have experienced homelessness or people who come from very disadvantaged families often don't have that extra person they can call mm -hmm. and ask for help. And so I definitely see, you know, a multi-tiered approach, but I'm, I'm really big on, you know, stipends and, and allowing them to make choice. Yeah, I think that principle of autonomy is something that you felt you mm -hmm. very much lost in your experience from reading your book and, and from getting to know you over the last few days. Um, would you be willing to share with those of us who haven't read the book uh, some details about your story? Of course. Thank you. Um, my, my story is, is shocking. It's more shocking that I survived everything that happened and, you know, that I was able to find a life that, you know, has meaning and purpose after everything that I, I went through. And I'm so grateful that I'm here. Um, I grew up in a, in a family of five children. I was the youngest and my parents were pretty dysfunctional. Um, my mom was bipolar. Um, my dad was most likely narcissist. We, we don't have a formal diagnosis, but I have my suspicions. And he, he didn't give me the kind of environment that I needed growing up. And he was very controlling. Um, my mother had a very bad manic episode when I was eight and she abandoned me and my brother. Um, he was about a year older. She abandoned us by the side of the road and left. And after that, we were placed in my dad's custody. That was kind of the stepping stone for, you know, a lot of the things that began to happen because he, he didn't know how to raise children. And this was in the late 80s when it wasn't common for divorce. And suddenly he was a divorced parent with, you know, kids. And usually dads didn't get custody during that time period. He immediately remarried and he married somebody who was clinically depressed and happened to share the same psychiatrist with my mother. And she started getting hospitalized just as my mom had been over the years. And as soon as she was hospitalized, my dad took us for a family meeting and they hospitalized me too. I was 11 and I didn't understand what was happening. I was a kid who was stubborn and I pushed back, but I wasn't a bad kid. I was just a kid that didn't understand what was going on in the world around me. And maybe my room wasn't clean and maybe I didn't do everything I was told to do, but I got good grades in school and I behaved for the most part. I wasn't a kid that needed to be hospitalized. And as a physician looking back, there is absolutely no way I can excuse that they put me there, but they forcibly hospitalized me. And I was there for two and a half months. And looking back, that is what sparked everything. I didn't feel safe at home anymore. My dad didn't have to hit me for me to feel unsafe because he could say he was sending me back. And he kept saying that after I went home. And so I started to run away. Running away became my safety because I was afraid of being locked up again. And at 13, I stole money from my dad and I ran away to California. And that was a long trip because I was coming from North Carolina was 3,000 miles and I was a very young kid and very naive. Um, but running away, I, I discovered a lot along the way. Um, I discovered, you know, that there were other kids like me and I found something in Los Angeles that I'd been missing. I found other kids who understood me and accepted me, even though I was, you know, very flawed from my own perspective. Um, I, I didn't stay very long. I was arrested for being a runaway. And I got sent back. And that was when I was introduced into the foster care system. Um, foster care immediately told me I, I couldn't see my mom because she hadn't been my custodial parent, but she was the only parent that I connected with. And so I kept running and I kept running until the judge was mad and he allowed my dad to press charges because I had stolen money when I had run away the first time. And that ended up getting me placed in maximum security juvenile prison for a sentence of two years for stealing $250. Um, I, I don't have words to describe how unreasonable that is for a child of trauma. You know, no one asked me what was going on or why I was running, but they placed me there and I spent 10 months before I got out on good behavior. And during that time, foster care canceled their decision to protect me and they sent me back to my dad's house. And it just continued to spiral out of control until the point where I was 16 and my dad said one day, you know what, I don't care if you're home or not when I come home. And that was all he had to say. You know, he said it and I packed my bag and I left. And after that, I came back to California and I stayed. And for me, the streets were safer than home. At least I knew that I didn't have to get locked into a little room. They offered and told me to go back to my family. My case managers consistently told me I needed to go home, but that wasn't home for me. Home was the streets. 
home was safe. Home was surrounded by other young people who had been through very remarkably scary lives as well, but they were a community and they protected me. It, it's, it's shocking to me that, you know, nobody heard or saw what I was saying, but I really needed somewhere that I could just grow and, and develop as the young person that I was without being told, you know, you need to go to foster care, you need to go home, you need to do this. I wanted to get a job and get an apartment. And that wasn't the plan that was offered to me, even though there was no way I was going back to North Carolina. Um, eventually I did become an adult. Eventually I did get off the streets when I was 19 and I had my first kid and I've been housed ever since. But how much struggle happened that didn't need to happen because there weren't any adults in place and there weren't any safeguards? I, I still look at that to this day and you know that's why I fight for young people because my story never had to happen. It shouldn't have happened and there should have been an adult there to step in and say this is wrong. So I'm going to be that adult for the rest of the kids. Thank you so much for sharing that and for being that adult for the kids who need. Um, I think we need so many more adults like you who are willing to just extend love to someone who maybe hasn't experienced it or doesn't expect it. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is the way that you both were invisible and at the same time were always trying to like hide and not be found or detected or maybe identified as being a kid on the streets rather than a kid who was out in the street. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and maybe also a little bit about what, what did it mean to you to have that community of other kids who for the first time you felt like somebody understood you even if they were not in a position of power? Of course, um, it, it's crazy to me that I found this community of kids where I didn't expect to find anyone who cared or understood. And it was immediate. Um, the moment that I ended up in Hollywood, um, a young girl came up to me and showed me exactly where I could go. She showed me that, you know, a lot of the youth were sleeping in front of Pantages Theater. Um, for those of you that don't know Hollywood or Los Angeles, Pantages Theater is where we have our Broadway shows. But during the 90s, it was closed down. And so the foyer in front of it was open. And for some reason, the owner allowed it to be open overnight. I think he knew that we needed somewhere to stay and there was nowhere else. This is before all the tent cities emerged in Los Angeles. Um, but this is where we stayed in the front every night. And in the morning every day, we would get up and leave so the cleaning man would come. And we respected that space because it was a space where we were allowed to sleep and we were safe. But that became home, this little open dark area in front of a theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And all of the kids that were there, you know, they cycled in and out. We had different kids that would come and others would leave. And that was my community. Um, when new kids came, we would immediately show each other where the food services were, where you could get a shower, um, basically anywhere that was safe and what to avoid. And it was this community that I, I didn't expect, but it was amazing because it was how I survived. What I was trying to survive from was being incarcerated again. My biggest fear the entire time that I was on the streets, up until the point that I was 18, was being found as a minor. And I didn't want anyone to recognize the fact that I was, you know, still a child. Um, being a minor meant that, you know, I was at risk just because of my age. Um, if I was picked up as a runaway, they could have easily sent me back to North Carolina. But I don't think I was really a runaway. At that point, I defined myself as something different because at 16, my dad had told me I could leave. And so I don't think that that really qualifies anymore. That kind of felt more like, you know, that other category where we call kids throwaways. I, I didn't feel like I had a place to go back to. And even if I was told to go back, I wouldn't have gone. I didn't feel safe there. And every time I'd had police intervention, my life had gone, you know, further in the wrong direction where I'd ended up, you know, in foster care and then in juvenile prison and then, you know, back with my dad. So there was no way I was going to let them know how old I was to the point that, you know, I was actively evading police even when I was in danger. Would you like to read us a little bit from your book? Of course. So um, we chose a section. I'm gonna read a part of when I was on the streets in Hollywood and I was just looking for somewhere safe to sit down. Um, a lot of the time, 
you know, you're asked to move along because, you know, Hollywood is a tourist destination very much like here. And you don't want to see like homeless youth, like just sitting there and occupying space when you're trying to have, you know, tourists come through and spend their money. And so it was a very unfortunate day and I was tired. I must have been lost in thought because I didn't see the security guard until he was standing next to me. The city had invested in a series of security guards to monitor traffic on the boulevard, specifically to keep the homeless kids moving and help beautify the city. You can't stay here, I heard a man say. I looked up and my eyes met with those of a security guard that I'd seen a few times. He was in his late twenties, Hispanic, stern features juxtaposed with kind eyes. I'm writing, I told him, passing a page from my booklet to him. He scanned the page, saw the drawing alongside my tragic poem. He sighed. You still can't stay here, he repeated. Sometimes it's hard, I said softly. Sometimes I can't keep moving and I just need to stop. It's the weekend. There are no services anywhere tonight. I have nowhere else to go, I told him. Our eyes connected for a long moment. It was getting dark and I knew I'd have to go somewhere eventually, but for the moment I felt safe. I was on the corner, exposed, but a wild creature surrounded by many watchful eyes. I was untouchable. All right, I'll give you 30 more minutes, he told me, but then you have to go. I nodded, grateful for a brief reprieve from the endless walking. I didn't like walking without a purpose. I wished I'd been able to stay at the shelter, but I was constantly battling with my case manager and he only saw one plan for me. I'd have to wait a few more weeks before trying again. I sat, staring at the foreign tourist, staring at the ground. Pink stars littered the sidewalks, and people traveled from afar to see a city that didn't match their expectations. Hollywood wasn't beautiful. It was dirty, lonely, harsh. Hollywood was a broken city filled with sadness, invisible people, and the people that followed behind them with plans to exploit them. That's so moving, isn't it? So one thing that I notice about this passage is that you're already writing. And you've made such an impact through your writing. And I think it's a big part of your role as an advocate and as that adult that kids need. Um, it sounds like it was a source of comfort for you from pretty early on, is that right? Yes, I, I don't know why, but I always found writing to be a space where I could really voice myself and voice my, my deepest thoughts that mm -hmm. you know I didn't really share with anybody, but I needed to get them on paper because I felt like I had all these ideas in my head that I needed to, to put somewhere. And you were a kid that nobody ever listened to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So was it a way of sort of trying to demand that right that every child should have to be heard, to speak I, to the paper? I think so. I think I was already trying to, to scream my story and my truths, but I didn't know where to to use that voice because mm -hmm. every time I tried to speak up, I got shut down. Mm -hmm. If I spoke up at the shelter, I got kicked out and I was kicked out frequently. You know, we, we had jokes about a lot of the shelters because we had one where, you know, we had records on who could get kicked out the fastest. You know, they weren't low barrier. They weren't, you know, places where you could go and, and heal from your trauma. They were places that the moment you sat down, you were already on the defensive and, you know, I needed some way to express that and I didn't have any other safe ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there, it sounds like there were a lot of times where you were unsafe and always kind of on the brink of the next crisis. Mm -hmm. And yet you also share in your book about a few people who were really kind of fundamental in your ability to begin to heal. And I think one of them is your friend, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And another one is the pediatrician mm -hmm. who was on his first day of residency when he met you on your first day of being a mom. Um, I would love it if you could share with us a little bit about what it meant to you to begin to be heard, to be seen as someone worthy of respect and love. And then maybe after that, we can talk a little bit about your journey as a physician who spreads that in the world. Of course. That, that physician, that was such a chance encounter. Um, my daughter was born at the end of June. And when she was born, the pediatrician and his brand new intern walked in the room to meet me. And his intern looked at me and looked at my baby and told me my baby was special. 
Now remember, I'm a kid that wasn't told that I was special and I hadn't heard anything positive in so very long. And from the moment he said that about my kid, I knew I wanted him to be my, my child's pediatrician. But then he kept going. He said, you know, this is my first day of residency and she is my very first patient and so she is always going to be special to me. And so that created a bond that, you know, I didn't expect, but it was, it was quite remarkable. Um, he encouraged me whenever I, I came in for visits. He would ask me, you know, how I was doing and, and he saw that I had enrolled in college classes. So he would ask me about, you know, how I was doing and what classes I was studying and what I wanted to do with my future. And slowly over time, our visits became, you know, a visit for my child, but also he was checking in to see what I was doing with my college coursework. And when I told him I, I was thinking about becoming a doctor, he started explaining the process to me. You know, I didn't know anyone who was a doctor and every doctor I'd ever encountered had been dangerous or, or caused harm. Um, you know, that hospital experience when I was 11 shockingly did not turn me away from medicine, but it could have. But this doctor made a difference and he showed me, you know, how to have compassion and how to listen while also providing really good care for my daughter. And so I felt really safe in that experience and I wanted to, you know, emulate that when I moved on and became a physician myself. It was remarkable and it was really the first time that I felt heard within the medical profession. And so I, I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, and that's such an important thing. And for us both as physicians, you know, we, we see our colleagues, some of them listening mm -hmm. compassionately and openly and non-judgmentally and some less so. And one of the things that you really radiate is compassion, empathy, mm -hmm. openness, open-mindedness. Medicine can be really alienating. Sometimes we're tired. We work very long shifts. We see patients who are struggling, who maybe wouldn't be in the hospital if they took their medicines or if they didn't have so many obstacles to health. Um, a lot of doctors, I think, naturally sometimes feel resentful or frustrated. And you're able to not feel those things and sort of translate your lived experience of facing so many barriers and obstacles and being unheard for so long into this like deep, broad compassion. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to take your own healing and then kind of offer it to others as a gift? It's, it's been just an amazing journey. Um, I, I didn't realize how special it was that I had gone through all of these experiences until I was in medical school and mm -hmm. I had patients start to mention it to me. They would tell me they knew I understood them and I didn't know what it was about me that was giving them that idea, but they would say, you know, I know you get it. And there was nothing I had said that should have given them that clue, but they knew. Mm -hmm. And it continued when I was in residency and people would share very detailed, very sometimes horrific stories with me so that I could get them towards a place of healing. And by the time I finished training, I realized what that was. And it had a lot to do with the experiences that I had had as a young adult and as an early mom trying to navigate this system as someone who had just recovered from being on the streets and was still dealing with trauma. I, I'm so honored to be able to see patients. And I think that's where the difference is sometimes is that like, I've never forgotten that this is an honor and a privilege. And, you know, we're allowed into places where no one else is able to go. Like I go into a patient room and I have permission to ask them anything. And I have permission to examine their body. And I can't forget that that is, you know, something that's very, very, private and personal and i have to give you know honor to that for the patients and so if they come to me and they're acting out of their trauma and they're struggling you know i absolutely want to recognize that and give them a place of safety in places where i didn't have it and and sometimes it doesn't look the way that you know it would look in a textbook sometimes if i go in a room you know the first thing i'm going to hear is a patient cursing me out and that's okay you know how many times did I curse out staff when I was 16, 17 years old at the shelter and get kicked out? I don't want to give that same response. The response isn't to shut people out, but it's to hear them and underneath the words and underneath the hurt. Because most of the time when patients are upset, it's not directed at me. 
it's directed at something and my job is to find out what that something is especially as a hospitalist you know we see patients often on the la like the worst day of their lives we see them when when things have gone bad when everything is wrong when the medicine didn't work when the diet didn't work when something changed and, and sometimes in yeah, they're in pain and and you know it's it's really easy just to say oh they're here for pain meds but you know i don't have the condition they have and i've come over time to understand that, you know, a lot of patients come in with the same complaint and they say it hurts. So maybe it hurts. Maybe we should treat that. You know, maybe I should listen and, and get a better understanding of why they're coming in. And so it's so important just to listen and, and really hear people because it's really easy, you know, as a physician to, you know, dismiss and, you know, not focus on what they're saying, but it's better and more meaningful for all of us to really get to know the patients and meet them where they are. And you know, there's well known and often cited research about how the average doctor will let a patient talk for seven seconds before interrupting, right? And uh, you know, we have a very structured way of asking questions. What brought you into the mm -hmm. hospital? You know, what makes it better or worse? When did it start? And you know, and it's, it's very structured and we teach all of this in medical school and residency and by the time you graduate and are an attending physician, you're supposed to know exactly how to put everything right kind of into the preordained structure of a history and physical note. Um, and yet what you're really saying is that you're declining that structure like of course you use it right because of you course. need it in order to diagnose and treat problems but that the first moment when you're meeting the patient is actually human to human mm -hmm. right can you tell us a little bit like practically speaking what do you say what is your body language what are you doing that is different that young doctors and not just doctors but social workers and psychologists and people you know case managers and teachers what is it that they should be doing in order to open a space for someone who's mm -hmm. traumatized, who's maybe acting out because of their trauma, mm -hmm. to be able to like blow off enough steam to get to that next level? Well, for me, one of the things that I, I like to do is I like to get down on eye level with patients. You know, there's this power structure the moment we walk in Absolutely. the room. I'm a physician, they're not. And even if they are, there's still a power structure because I'm the one who, you know, makes the decisions about what medications they're getting and what the treatment plan is and whether or not I believe their symptoms. And so it's so important just to kind of get down on their level and, and talk to them like they're a regular person. Um, I, I love the way you introduce yourself to patients, and I would love for you to share that. Sure. Uh, we were talking in the car on the way over here about, so I'm also a hospitalist, and um, the sort of traditionally taught question to start a history and physical with is, what brought you into the hospital today? And I don't start with that question. Usually I say, my name is Dr. Maxim, and I'm going to need to ask you a whole lot of questions to figure out what's going on with you and how we're going to get you better. Or, not, or I may say this to the parent, you know, what's going on with your child and how to get him or her better. Um, but before we get started, I would like to know if there's anything that you're really worried about or anything that you need. And that question really enables me to find out where that person who I've often never met before is is coming from. So I get questions all the way from, do you validate the parking? Can I have a glass of water? I'm cold, I need a blanket. To, is my child gonna die? I don't have childcare for my three children who are in the car, you know, all sorts of things that I can then say, okay, I can see your child is stable. Like they're breathing, the heart is pumping, everything is okay for right this moment, sick, but not emergency. So let me attend to this problem that you just raised for me and then let's get to talking about the clinical stuff. And that's helpful for a couple of reasons, but I think the biggest reason is that it enables parents or kids, if they're old enough to talk, to feel heard and respected and like I am seeing them as a human to another human. And also it enables them later to be able to concentrate better on the questions that I have to ask about what actually is their illness because they're no longer worrying if their child is gonna die. And if I can say, you know, I totally understand where you're coming from. I'm a mom too and it's so scary when your kid is sick, but these are the reasons why I think your child is not in danger. I'm really glad you came here. She's sick, but she's not in danger right now and we're gonna get her better. That makes 
such a huge mm -hmm. difference mm -hmm. to the sort of beginning forging of that relationship and to gaining trust, Absolutely. which can be hard for so many reasons, you know, um, racial trauma and mm -hmm. a history of being discriminated against, um, sexual and gender minorities often, you know, have a history of being whether misgendered or mistreated, or if they're, you know, two same gender parents, maybe of, you know, assumptions being made about the family structure mm -hmm. and on and on and on. So many people have some kind of trauma related to experiences in healthcare that if you start by essentially saying, I'm a human, you're a human, I am here to connect with you and to fix your problem. It makes everything else so much easier after that. I wish you had been my doctor when I was little. <laughs> that would have made the difference. And this is exactly why we're talking about this because we need doctors who use trauma-informed principles where you're talking to patients and, and really meeting them you know, where they are without re-traumatizing, without you know, bringing up things that don't need to be brought up for the sake of just knowing them, but really just talking to people about, you know, what's related to their current concern and, and just making sure that we're addressing their concerns, but also having compassion and kindness and, and addressing the, the parking issue because people are really worried about extra mm -hmm. bills and parking validation. And it's so important to, you know, answer all those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even tell you the number of times I've gotten blankets for patients. You know, it's yeah. just what like we do. Like and water, it <laughs> makes such a difference. It's, it's not that hard. We can get a blanket. Yes, and we are not above that. And exactly. I think, you know, th you know, there is this natural hierarchy to mm -hmm. medicine, right? But I like to try to deconstruct that mm -hmm. because really I'm not a better person. I know what I'm supposed to know because this is my job. And there's a lot of stuff I don't know, including how to interpret your child's behavior, you know? Absolutely. And I often tell parents, like, I know medicine, you know your kid. And that's another really nice way to connect. And so I, I love to kind of teach our learners those kind of phrases, too, because it helps to, like, I think it helps to give, like, practical tips for how to connect, as opposed to just, like, philosophical mm -hmm. approaches. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I know that, you know, in my experiences, when I'm seeing, like, adult patients in the hospital, if I go and I meet them at bedside and I'm having a conversation with them and they can't open the food on their tray, mm -hmm. I'm preparing their food for them. I'm mixing totally. their coffee while we're talking. Yep. I'm preparing their bowl of breakfast and adding sugar and butter and all the other stuff that I probably don't want them to add to it, but mm -hmm. they want it. So we're <laughs> going to go ahead and go with it. And, you know, it's it's that whole moment where I've now analyzed that they need help and maybe they're going to get home health or go to a nursing home, but we've also connected. And so all of that medical care still happened, but at a better, deeper level mm -hmm. than if I had just come in glanced at them, walked away and not made sure that they were also fed. You know, it's yeah. it's something where we can all go above and beyond, but it's not really taught that way. And I really wish it was. I, I completely agree with you. Um, before we finish up, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, specific ways that you connect with people who have been traumatized or minoritized and you shared with me that you're the mother of a non-binary teenager and um, you have you were very careful in your presentation yesterday to talk about using correct terminology and using the right pronouns um, about racial trauma mm -hmm. and the way that that can affect uh, a patient's response or ability to maybe feel trusted and respect or feel trust towards you. Um, is it the same kind of just open listening, making the breakfast? You know, it, it all comes down to just that. It's, it's meeting people exactly where they are, but then understanding that, you know, people who come to us, they've had experiences in medicine that haven't necessarily been healthy. And so we have to go above and beyond. You know, I might have to tell a patient, you know, you will be respected. And if anyone in your team does not respect you, this is the person you can call because we will use your correct pronouns and we will use your preferred name. And I'm sorry that it's happened the wrong way. You know, I was telling them yesterday in a talk, I had a patient recently, I went in to see her and I asked her what her preferred pronouns were and they were she and her. And I asked for her name because the medical record at that hospital doesn't reflect the correct name in her chart and she started to cry because no one had asked her and she'd already been there for hours before I got the call to admit and she told me how many people referred to her as he and how much it hurt her 
and then how it actually impacted her current medical condition. And there were some very specific things that had happened because she was afraid to come to the hospital and she waited to come in because she knew she would have this experience. You know, it's our job to really see each patient and make sure that their needs are met. And one of those needs is identifying patients the way they choose to be identified. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt us at all. And that's, that's why I speak so you know, proudly of my child. You know, It doesn't hurt me at all to refer to them as they, them, but it hurts them if they're misgendered. And so it's my job to make sure that they feel safe wherever they are. And if I have to educate other people about it and let them know, I mean, that's my job as their advocate. And that's what we do for patients. We have to advocate mm -hmm. for them in the exact same way. If we see every patient as someone who's potentially a family member, someone who you know we're gonna wrap around and provide care for, the way that we would take care of a brother, a sister, a cousin, a parent, you know, it, it changes everything. Every patient, I see them as a potential family member and there's no room for error there. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your story, so much of your journey, so much of your spirit and the way that you spread grace in the world. Thank you. Um, I would love to just close by zooming back out and thinking about how do we make there be more Cheryl Racinosas in the world? How do we make kids feel loved and respected and safe? Um, are there specific bills in your state? And I, I recognize you're a visitor here and you obviously are not as familiar with what's going on here, but you do know that we have a very large um, problem with a, a unhoused population that is struggling and has a hard time a lot of the time accessing the services that they need um, federally on the state level um, specific organizations that you partner with can you tell us a little bit about how those of us listening can get involved share our knowledge or learn more or take action? Absolutely. There are several bills that they've been trying to push through. And, you know, I, I love to see this legislative action where we're trying to find a way to end homelessness. Um, the best one that I've seen is the one that has been put forth by Cori Bush, where the plan is to end homelessness by 2025. I've seen a number of bills that have come out where, you know, that that date is pushed back further and further, 2030, 2035. If we can't make it happen in the next couple of years, we're not serious. 2025 is still three years away and that's still too long. Our plan really needs to be within a year because if we wanted to end homelessness, we could do it today. We have all of those open houses and apartments and government buildings that are not being utilized. We could end it. We spend a lot of money by putting a Band-Aid on a problem without actually making change. And we could do so much better. As far as you know, each person, you know, what you can do is, it, it varies based on how strongly you feel about this. You can work locally within your communities. Um, if there is a proposal for a program or you know, some kind of you know, new housing development within your community, be a Yimby. Don't be one of those not in my backyards. Be a yes in my backyard. Every community needs to be part of this solution. We are a community of people and we absolutely have to do better for our unhoused population. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, we have people who are outside starving with no bathroom, no food, no refrigeration, no bed, nothing, none of those basic necessities for life. And we go on about our business like it's not happening. When those days happen and I'm at home and it's cold or it's hot, like I can't stop thinking about them because I know what it's like to lay on the ground when it's cold or it's hot and nobody cares and you don't have food and you don't know where the bathroom is and the police might come and harass you. You know, we have to do better. Everybody has a part to play in this, whether it's, you know, helping volunteer with a local community or going and speaking to your congressman. It's time for us to end this problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheryl Racinos, for sharing your experiences, your knowledge, your wisdom, your grace with us. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. Mahalo. Thank you.